This is one of the striking gospels of our blessed Lord, especially this allusion to fire. From the fullness of his sacred heart, Jesus exclaims exquisitely and incandescently, he has come to set the world on fire. What did the Jews hear when they heard that? Those who were learned in the scriptures would have most likely associated with the prophecy of Malachi, who speaks about the coming of the Lord, who would come as a refiner's fire, purifying like, like a refiner's fire, purifying silver and gold. The Lord's company coming would accompany a purification of our souls in order to bring us into righteousness, right relationship with God, and to purify us by the fire of his love of all of the falsehoods of the world, the flesh, and the devil that compromise our communion with our creator in a relationship of covenant compassion and true love. So Elijah was the figure associated with preparing the way of the Lord who would come as a refiner's fire and who would come reconciling fathers with their sons and sons with their fathers. Part of this purification would be a healing of family divisions in order for there to be communion, not only with God, but with one another. When our Lord is speaking about this fire, it has, there's two sides to the coin. This purifying fire that, jealous, that Jesus zealously desires to cast upon the earth. On one hand, it is this purification. But that purification is preparation for Pentecost. And Pentecost signifies the fire of love's communion, setting our souls ablaze with the glory of God through the outpouring of his grace. That's the other side of the other, the other side of the coin. The other side of the cross is this experience of resurrection after our passion and purification. Jesus immediately speaks about, after speaking about the blaze of this fire, he refers to his baptism. And the baptism our Lord Jesus is referring to in this context is not the baptism of water. It's his own baptism by fire, his passion, the shedding of his blood. And that fire was in his blood. And that shedding of his precious blood throughout his passion is a preparation for us to be filled with the fire of his love that purifies our souls from sin and reconciles us with God. And this was the baptism that kept him in anguish. He knew how much he was going to have to suffer in order to pay the wages of sin, in order to be the instrument of reconciliation as our high priest representing all of fallen humanity at the cross, in order to raise up humanity, to elevate humanity, to be made worthy of God's glory. We hear in the first reading from St. Paul to the Romans, this is one of the most theologically dense letters of St. Paul. It's referred to as the Mount Everest of the New Testament because of the density of its theology. And St. Paul in today's passage, this, today, this morning's passage ends with, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're familiar with the term minimum wage. There's the, the least amount, you're at least deserved to, to earn this much money for an honest day's labor. When you've given an honest day's labor, you at least 
deserve minimum wage. This is the, 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 the kickback of what you deserve. Sin's payback always results in death. It's always the fruit of sin, death to the soul, and death to all that is true, the truth of God in us, the beauty of God in us, and the goodness of God in us, gradually, little by little, more and more, subtly through venial sin, more drastically through mortal. And it always bears that fruit. Death, darkness, separation from all that is true, good, and beautiful of happiness of, and, hap and what brings true happiness, it separates us from that. And one of the enemy's favorite tactics then is to disguise sin, to disguise evil as good. So, we don't even, so a person doesn't even realize uh, that what they're choosing is, is self-inflicting harm, is self-destructive. And as one of the popes of last century pointed out that the greatest sin of the 20th century is the denial of the very existence of sin. And because when we do that, we don't even realize we need a savior. It all becomes about our own self-sufficiency, the sovereign self. And the sovereign self, ourselves relying upon our own resources apart from God's grace will never amount to the glory of what God offers and invites us to receive freely based on him not on any greatness that we can muster up. To conclude, this image of slavery that St. Paul refers to, he speaks of slave, you, you who once were slaves to impurity and lawlessness, you gave yourselves to this lifestyle, which began with a certain mindset, and as a result of this false sense of freedom, because of the counterfeit promises that the world, the flesh, and the devil offers, what you thought was bringing you freedom left you as slaves. And you became slaves to the very things that you adored as being the sources of your happiness, these externals. And as a result, you became slaves of sin. But in coming to know Christ Jesus, your lives were changed and now you're invited to be slaves of, to righteousness for sanctification. Slaves to what is right. To give your life freely in service to someone and something greater than yourself. By that surrender, you become sanctified you become transformed in your true self, in the image and likeness of God. And I don't know where it began, but there's a tradition with the small t that those who do the total consecration to our Blessed Mother Mary, according to St. Louis de Montfort or some other saint like St. Maximilian Colby, that they wear a little chain around their wrists. Have you ever seen that little chain? You can't buy it at Catholic bookstores. I've never seen it at a Catholic bookstore myself. But usually people will go to like Home Depot uh, or Orchard Supply and they'll make one of these chains for themselves, which represents what we're hearing from St. Paul today. What it means to be slaves of righteousness, giving ourselves totally to Jesus through Mary. Acknowledging that after Jesus, our lives, our souls, our hopes belongs totally to our Mother Mary. And in that respect, we are her slaves. And in doing so, by surrendering to her and entrusting our lives to her, she draws us more fully into the sanctification of her spouse, the Holy Spirit. As we celebrate this Eucharist, we pray that the flame of love of her immaculate heart 
may set our souls ablaze with the fire that Jesus Christ desires to enkindle in our souls that we may be totally transformed into the fire of God's love through the flame of her heart as slaves of Jesus through Mary. Amen.